Good afternoon. Check, check. It works, okay. Uh, so, I'm Vitaly Kamluk, I'm Chief Malware Expert from Kaspersky Lab. Okay, maybe we shall stand here. Uh, and today we're going to yeah, discuss uh, Duku malware and specifically its uh, CNC infrastructure, something that we discovered we're going to share today. And first of all, I have to say that all this research and Duco and Stuxnet and that we do in Kaspersky is just, you know, uh, we're doing that as a, as a malware researchers and there is no political motivation or any, you know, government sponsored stuff that moves us on. So it's done just almost, you know, in politically independently from any country, any state. That's why uh, we're just, you know, uh, look at Duku and Stuxnet as another example of malware, that's all. Um, we are presenting together with Kostin here. However, this presentation is made uh, by three researchers. There is uh, Alex Gostev, also chief security expert from uh, Russian team. He's not here, so there are just two. Uh, here are Linux fans, and I'm a power user and a fan of Debian and Ubuntu. Uh, so we have some background and experience uh, working with um, Linux, which actually helped us during uh, our research, as you will see later. Um, Actually, here is a, a photos uh, of the rest of the team who actively participated in this research. However, the the whole team, the whole group of people who was involved, is uh, much bigger than that. So, what is Duku exactly? Well, first of all, it's a sophisticated attack, uh, which seems to be related closely to Stuxnet. Uh, malware, and we will shed some light how it is related a bit later. And it, it was developed, uh, it was active since 2008, uh, and discovered only in uh, 2011 by Hungarian research lab. So it seems to be used as a cyber espionage tool by uh, some nation state sponsored uh, organization. Um, let's dive into similarity of Stuxnet and Duku. Uh, both malware, we think, are based on the same platform. And this platform called Tilded, or Tilded, uh, has the same components, which are specific to this platform, and it is not present in any other malware that we have seen. These are four um, base components, which, was, which were found in both Duku and Stuxnet. First of all, it's a driver. They, they use a sys file uh, with random names, like here are examples of Stuxnet and Duku names. Um, both of them have uh, encrypted DLL file stored in a PNF file on disk. Uh, both of them have uh, another PNF file which is uh, not an executable but uh, an encrypted config file, big config file. Uh, also stored on the hard drive with almost random names. Um, and both malware uses uh, mini config stored in a, as a binary value in the registry, also encrypted which has a reference to the to the bigger config file. So all these things are pretty specific to particular malware and we haven't found we haven't found any uh, any other malware that uses uh, the same uh, components and approach. Another uh, another uh, way of looking on this uh, to malicious developments is the following. I suggest a, a game of binary similarity. A uh, very simple idea that we applied during our research to find and understand why these things are similar. So this is a simple thing. We have a binary data, some uh, random data here on the top, zeros and ones. Uh, so we convert them into image, very simple, bitmap. Uh, so black spot corresponds to the value of one and zero is uh, white. So from this, uh, data block, we get uh, approximately this picture. So if we apply that to a group of files, here we can see six files. And now I want to ask you, the audience, uh, from your perspective, which files are similar? Understanding that uh, 
actually the, the whole structure doesn't change. Uh, the particular parts of the file can be increased or decreased because of you know some code may be uh, maybe added to the section and something can be just removed. So it just shrinks or grows. So any suggestions? Two and six. Two and six. Any others? One three. Two, four. Um, by the way, uh, let's let's try our hands actually and see how many people think. Uh, starting from two and six. How many people think it's uh, similar? One, two, three, or oh. maybe about 10, 15 people. Uh, one and three, who thinks they're similar? One, just one. Any other uh, opinions? Cool. Well, it just perfectly shows uh, how technical our audience is, because when I asked uh, the journalists, <laughs> there were so many opinions. <laughs> However, about, I don't know, 40% of them uh, concluded that 2 and 6 are the most similar. And let's uncover what these blocks are. They actually stand for particular files. Some of them are benign, taken from Windows XP. They are drivers of approximately the same size. And 2 and 6, as you see, uh, Duku and Stuxnet correspondingly. So if we take a closer look at these two, if we just shift a little bit, you can see um, the obvious pattern uh, showing the similarity of the things, which are you know, pretty unique uh, and is not met in other files. So it actually also showed us that uh, these things are similar from, from this perspective. So if we dissect these files and see um, what, what is there actually inside, you can see even the order of uh, particular uh, places in the file uh, is kept the same. So the text strings, uh, init data, and you know, some DLL loader code, code for process uh, injection, they are in the same position. Just, you know, uh, they are the same, as I told you, uh, but can be some block can be increased and the other can be shrinked. Um, most of them have digital signatures. But here is the most interesting part is the init uh, data and the, the encrypted config file, uh, config which uh, follows the init data. And uh, encrypted config is embedded in the body of the malware and uh, also shows um, a strict uh, relation between Duku and uh, Stuxnet. Because if we take that encrypted config embedded in the body and decrypt that according to the procedure, uh, and actually this malware has different procedures for decoding both blocks, uh, we see the very similar result. So if we extract the strings, Actually, the encrypted config is, when you decrypt it, it's full of zeros, and uh, it has just three Unicode strings. These are the strings from those malware. Uh, the first thing uh, is the registry path, where the value, uh, which is the second string, uh, is located, and that value is the name of the um, binary registry block having another encrypted part of, of the whole config. Um, and the last string is the virtual device name that is used to uh, for communication between uh, user space and kernel space. So, and um, this is uh, the P header of Duku driver. Uh, sorry, not Duku driver, but one of the Duku uh, modules. And the interesting thing here is the link date. As you can see it here, it was linked in 2007 in August, which kind of shows when the attackers actually uh, had some working modules already and probably started operation. And this is the timeline uh, of the whole platform. So the modules that I showed you uh, on the previous slide, which is dated uh, 2007, uh, seems to be uh, malware independent. It's part of the platform, but it's not specific to Duku. Um, so it seems like these modules were created in the first place, somewhere around 2007 or 2008. And then uh, Stuxnet modules. Stuxnet Worm was created in uh, 2009 and developed in 2010 as well. And only after that, Duku malware appeared. And these modules, uh, you can see here, the, the dates extracted from, from the files that we received. Uh, let's go further. 
We actually have a pretty long story on our uh, website, securelist.com, and we had a 10 parts of blog posts with all the details from particular stages of analysis. And this presentation actually includes most interesting parts uh, from this research, as well as uh, we'll show you some things that were never uh, public, that were never published on the, on the website. So I hope you will find it interesting. If you have more, uh, if you want more information about particular stages, you can check the website as well. So, uh, who were the victims of of this malware? We think there were about five categories of potential victims that Duco attacked. It was power and energy industry, supply chain, shipment and uh, procurement. It was uh, military organizations and the PNC design uh, companies, certificate authorities, or authority. So uh, they are mainly uh, located in Iran. Uh, we collected all the evidence and all the sources, summed it up, and well, you can see here a chart, a diagram showing that uh, most of them were in Iran. So it still uh, remains the same that Iran was the main target of both, uh, both malware. So uh, what's a typical scenario how victims actually get infected with, with Duku? And the scenario uh, is the following. First of all, I have to say that uh, from our perspective, we think that there are just three companies in the world who actually put their hands on the real infected machine and got the real uh, analysis uh, of the infected host. Uh, one of them is uh, us, and we are going to uh, share some data based on our on our analysis. Uh, when we first added the signature for the malware, uh, several days later, we discovered that there is just one computer which uh, reported uh, about infection of Duku, which looked pretty strange because comparing to Stuxnet, it infected like thousands of computers. And in Duku case, it was just one, located in this country, in Sudan. Um, it was not very uh, easy, you know, to to establish all the contacts, uh, to contact the national CERT team. Uh, however, we managed to do that. It took us some time, and the guys in the CERT team were pretty responsive and uh, pretty capable of helping us in uh, locating the uh, infected machine and getting the image. Uh, it was in uh, Khartoum city, the capital of, of Sudan. And I have to say that uh, Sudan itself is a pretty interesting country. And if you just go and Google for you know, images using the keyword Sudan, you can find on the first page is something like this. And this. And this. So I think we were pretty lucky uh, with you know, getting the real information and finding the, the evidence of, of the targeted attack made by the attackers. Uh, this is how the Khartoum city looks like. Uh, we managed to find that machine, and it took us about a week. We checked all the possible ways of you know, uh, malware uh, infection, and we, we tried to recover deleted files, so we, we checked here and there, and it really took us several days. We, we were looking, first of all, for the uh, PDF with a zero-day exploit. Uh, however, what we found was not a PDF. It was actually an email with a doc attachment. Um, so the the Word document had the TTF parsing vulnerability, which allowed the attacker to get on the kernel level right after opening the document by, by the victim. Um, it looks like this the, the whole document inside had just one page with five questions related to some business operations and a picture. Picture was probably put there, you know, to hide the encrypted parts of uh, of the shared code inside of the document, you know, to, to mix it with the JPEG information. Uh, and it actually looked very much like typical phishing mail, which works, which which works for you know many people and is kind of uh, already. Uh, proof technology that I uh, know using the social engineering techniques and you know, making some business offer, asking questions and attaching documents actually works very well uh, with marketing people. 
So the full cycle, uh, after a user opened the document, do you have a question? Did they actually open the document? In order did they open the document? Did the, did the, the email recipient have to open that document? Yes, exactly. Uh, actually, there were two, two mails from, from the same sender, and uh, the first mail was ignored, and the second one sent on the next day was, was opened. Um, so after opening the document, uh, the vulnerability worked, and the code got on the kernel, kernel level and uh, stayed there for 10 minutes, waiting for 10 minutes of user inactivity, maybe waiting for the user to leave the computer, and then uh, it uh, dropped the, uh, it loaded the additional uh, uh, code and uh, installed the service so that the uh, machine was infected after, after the reboot created uh, the uh, config files and the registry config value and so on, and contacted the CNC to load additional components. Um, so after infection of the victim, what's next? Um, the way it worked and the way it contacted how we discovered actually the CNC and the link to CNC was the following. As I told you, um, Duke Malware has an encrypted PNF file on the hard drive. This is how it looks like located in C Windows in folder. So it's just uh, a random data from the first site. When you decrypt it, you can see, uh, maybe not very clear to see here, but it's a, a P file, is MZ header, and it has a resource section, .rsrc, very small text here, you can see it now. Um, if you look into the uh, RSRC section, uh, we can see another section inside, which is a uh, Zdata, and Zdata section looks like this. This is a, a compressed file inside of this section. If we decompress that, uh, there is a plain text IP address embedded uh, into the executable model, which actually links to the particular CNC. And this is how we uh, how we found that, and then we, we followed the, the traces where the malware connected. We tried to understand uh, who operates it and uh, how it works. So we got the IP address. What's next? Uh, the next is to contact the owner of the hosting company. This IP uh, was well, it's. Uh, pretty public, you can Google it, actually. And this one was located in India, in Mumbai. It belonged to a company called Webworks, and they had data centers, dedicated uh, servers um, in, in Mumbai. So um, the whole idea behind it was to contact the owner of the data center and kindly ask to, to share the information we need. Here are some more IPs that everybody knows. You can Google them. Uh, of known CNCs uh, from from Duku and some other unknown CNCs in other countries. You can see that they're geographically pretty widespread. Um, and there were other servers which um, we found later. And this is a list of, of IPs and countries. Um, Duku actually used not just a single server to have the business logic on it, but they uh, the attackers built a chain of servers uh, working as a proxies. So what you see here, the uh, IP addresses, uh, which are used as a proxies. And from our um, observation, uh, we found that they used up to you know, three level of proxies, making a chain of servers to transfer information from one server to another. And we had to, to follow the, the traces, you know, jumping from one server to another and, you know, asking for another hosting company to share the data. Uh, however, we didn't reach the, the source server, the final CNC, which actually had the business logics. But we extracted a lot of useful information on the way. And um, what kind of information? And you know, the most juicy part, uh, Mr. Kostin Ryo is going to share with us. Thanks, Vitaly. Can you all hear me? Okay. Clicker? Yeah. All right, so, um, 
how do you get access to the command and control servers so, or to all these servers? And actually we have a couple of methods. And the one that we actually we found that it's surprisingly efficient is just to ask nicely. So you write an email and say like, we're from Kaspersky Lab, we're investigating this uh, malware, so would you be so kind and give us access? And uh, usually the answer is no. So you go like a second time and say, please, pretty please, can you give us access? And they'll say no. So you keep asking, you know, a couple of times until you exhaust all the options. And finally, you get to the point when you explain the threat. And you'll say, OK, so you, you have two options. Uh, you either work with us or we will send the police. Or so just that uh, send the information to the police. Police will contact you. They'll take your server. And uh, I'm sure that will be very pleasant for you. So that moment, usually, you know, they give you access to, to the server. And actually, we have a pretty good uh, result here. Out of the 10 servers where we attempted to get the image, we managed to get the image from six of those. Uh, and from four of those, we couldn't get access. And six of those actually provided some really interesting data. But I think that uh, the, the other side of the coin here is that um, those where we couldn't get access. And if you're wondering, maybe you, know, maybe you guys have some idea where the best bulletproof hosting in the world is. Any any countries? Any names? Come on. Netherlands, <laughs> Russia, Ukraine. Ukraine. Nobody says China. China. China, Taiwan. No, actually it's Switzerland. And I, <laughs> it's funny that you know these people they take care of their servers as good as they take care of their money. Um, we had two servers in Switzerland. There was absolutely no way to get any information. Uh, they were absolutely denying everything. They denied the servers uh, have anything. They even denied that the servers have uh, OpenSSH on it. Although you could connect to port 22 and see there's a <laughs> secure shell server. They said, like, there's nothing on the server. Go away. So, yeah, no luck. Anyways, from the other servers. So the first uh, thing we noticed, uh, which was uh, very, very interesting, is that all every single server was running uh, CentOS. And for those of you who don't know, that's a kind of uh, you know free version of Red Hat. Um, and I thought I was curious that every single server was running CentOS. I thought that maybe there should be some for running Ubuntu or you know whatever distribution of Linux Gen 2. Uh, but no, all of them were actually running uh, CentOS. Uh, like 5.5, 5, 5.4, 5, 5.6, 5, 5.3. 5, uh, two of them were 64-bit. All the others were actually 32-bit. So different configurations, quite different configurations. But they were all running uh, CentOS. And they also have been hacked uh, like uh, in 2009, 2010, and 2011. So that was the first time we managed to identify um, illegal access to these machines. And um, to analyze these servers, we used uh, you know, SleuthKey, which is a pretty good tool. And then we uh, created some of our own tools as well. Uh, we created some tools because uh, we had to work with huge amounts of data. So we wanted to filter all that, uh, all that irrelevant data before searching it. So what exactly we were doing here, was, you know, we just get rid of all the empty spaces. Check, check. Um, and then we'll extract the strings, we'll uh, list all the deleted files on the server image, and uh, we'll just plot a, a timeline, and then we'll start grabbing for stuff. And here, you know, it's important to, to know what to look for, because uh, we're looking at like gigabytes of data, so you have to know what to look for. So we're looking for stuff such as uh, accepted connection, or things such as UTMP, WTMP fragments, RSA private key, uh, port 443 connections, and so on. So what did we find, actually? Um, well, the first thing that the attackers would do when they would uh, hack one of these machines, they would install OpenSSH 5.8. And that is important because CentOS comes with OpenSSH 4.3. So the first thing, they would update to 5.8. So we asked some people in the community, like, what is the reason you want to update uh, OpenSSH 4.3 to 5.8? And pretty much everybody said that the first thing an attacker does when they get access to a machine, they close the hole, which allows them to get access in the first place. So just close the hole so that other hackers you know, don't get to your server. Uh, which is kind of scary, uh, because in theory, uh, Red Hat uh, and the CentOS, they come with a quite secure patched version of uh, OpenSSH 4.3. And well, 
they also did some other things. They would update the configuration files of the OpenSSH server, so they would remove two important options, the GSS API authentication and the use DNS option. So they would set them from yes, they would change them to no. And they did this on pretty much every single server. Uh, so we were kind of confused uh, in the beginning, uh, like wondering, did they actually use a vulnerability in the GSS API? Um, in order to exploit the servers, and um, after you know, after a while, we simply decided that this was done simply for uh, performance issues because we we found that when these options are enabled, access to the server is much slower. Uh, another important finding was that on October 20th, 2011, they logged into every single of these machines and they wiped those machines clean. Um, and that is important because the news about Duku uh, broke, I think it was October um, 17. So it took a couple of days probably for this thing to you know, reach uh, huge proportions. So at some point they took the decision, they'll simply shut down the whole operation. So they had people logging in into every single of these machines, cleaning them. Pretty much all servers, I think it took days, if not hours. And they were actually careful enough to use a shred command. Uh, and uh, if you don't know what it does, the shred command, you know, before deleting a file, it will fill it with trash, with zeros, and only then it will delete the file, just, you know, to make sure that the file cannot be recovered. But still, uh, they did not take into account some very important things, the pitfalls of uh, X3 on Linux. Uh, so when you delete a file using the shred command, uh, first of all, you can still see which file was deleted. Uh, that information is kept. Secondly, uh, deleting the logs doesn't take care of the slack space, so it doesn't take care of the files which have already been deleted. And remember that the logs, uh, they get rotated. So that means that we can still find logs, you know, from the past. And that was like very useful information. And finally, there are all these operations of uh, file reallocations and truncations. Uh, these files, such as UTMP and WTMP, they grow and they shrink depending on people logging in in the system. And when they shrink, the data doesn't get deleted. So based on all this uh, information, actually, we extracted some, some pretty uh, interesting things from the command and control servers. And um, let me show you a timeline of such um, uh, deletions from one of the servers. And basically, the most important thing happens here. So on October the 20th, you can see there's like a spike in the number of file deletions. So obviously, something big is going on here. This is a moment when they logged in into the server to clean it. And there's also some interesting activity, you know, prior to October 20th, which indicates that the, probably they were actively, actively using the server for, um, you know, pretty much the APT attack. And there's also an interesting event on 19th of July when they installed OpenSSH 5.8p2. Uh, and they also installed OpenSSH 5.8p1 on 15th of uh, February. So I think that was the moment when this server was hacked. Uh, on 15th of February, they did a uh, init.d cleanup and then they installed this server. Um, there were also two very interesting events, which we couldn't figure exactly what they were about. Uh, they were Dovecot. Uh, Dovecot is a uh, IMAP server for Linux, and, and it crashed twice. So in the whole history of this server, it crashed twice. It crashed just before they got access to the server, and it also crashed somewhere in the middle of February. So in the beginning, we thought maybe they hacked these machines uh, using a Dovecot vulnerability, uh, which we are still not 100% sure that it was not the case. Uh, but we have a couple of theories about how these machines were actually getting hacked. And um, the first theory is, you know, simple brute forcing of the root passer. Uh, and why is that? Because from one of the logs that you see here, um, there's like a failed password, failed password for root a couple of times, about eight times. And finally, the ninth time, they get it right. And, you know, here we thought maybe they're just simply brute forcing the passwords. However, what I tried, I, I recovered the shadow file and I tried to brute force the password myself using uh, John the Ripper. So, you know, tools which are a lot more powerful than uh, trying to brute force the password by uh, port 22 connections. And I tell you that, you know, I tried billions of passwords and I couldn't break it simply because the password was strong. So that means this was not, you know, the method they used. Uh, another possibility was, a, as I was saying, OpenSSH 4.30 day. Uh, and there's actually some interesting discussions on the internet uh, from people who are claiming their machines 
running um, CentOS with OpenSSH 4.3 were getting hacked. Um, and I feel now, you know, there are different opinions, and some people say this is, you know, just crazy that all this, uh, you know, it's not sustainable. I mean, all of that is not really true. And in my opinion, is that simply too scary to be true? If there was a uh, zero-day vulnerability in OpenSSH 4.3, that means that you know maybe 50% of the machines of the servers on the on the internet would be vulnerable to this attack. Um, and there is actually a third option, which I think it is the most likely. The third option is that probably there is another malware out there. So they were using another password stealing malware, maybe a version of Duku, to infect some people, the sysadmins, and to steal their passwords. And then probably they had like a list of passwords for different servers, which they were trying. So that's why you see eight or nine different failed attempts before they finally you know, uh, get to the right password. So I think that maybe this is, uh, you know, the most likely um, um, explanation, and it's actually sustained by the fact that besides Duku and Stuxnet, we found evidence of three other um, malwares, which are neither Duku, they're neither Stuxnet. Uh, they're like similar to Duku and Stuxnet. So what we have found is that uh, during the development of Duku and Stuxnet, they were like uh, branches. So they created some other malware based on the same platform. Unfortunately, we haven't seen the malware itself. We've only seen the loaders for that malware. But based on the loaders, um, it is clear that there were some similar projects, some parallel projects to Stuxnet and Duke. So at least we are talking uh, of at least three other similar projects. So uh, I think this is, you know, the letters are too small for you to see. But the idea is that uh, there are th at least three other malwares besides Duke and Stuxnet, built on top of this platform. So, um, let me show you some facts about these hacked servers. Uh, and one of them, server B, actually there was a very, very special case because we managed to get a memory dump. And the memory dump came from the live server. After the attackers cleaned the server on October 20th, they didn't reboot it. So all these operations actually were still in memory. Uh, and we, uh, we scanned the memory, and deep inside the memory dump, we found some interesting, um, some interesting strings. Um, what do you think? You are, what you can see here is obviously you see the SSH 2.0 open SSH 4.3 banner. And this is an interesting, uh, an interesting server, which was not used as a CC itself. It was used as a proxy, so like a jumping point. And this one was not updated to um, open SSH 5.8 for some reason. So what you see here uh, is uh, the OpenSSH 4.3 banner, but there's also some other suspicious information in here. Anybody can spot it. Uh, it's the, the Sharp SSH banner, the second one here. So anybody knows what uh, Sharp SSH is? Let's Google it. So if you Google uh, Sharp SSH, <laughs> I didn't know either. Uh, <laughs> You'll find like, uh, well, the first, the first it is interesting. It says, tired of sharp SSH bugs? So just try our solution. And the second one is actually the uh, website of the developer of sharp SSH. So what exactly is uh, sharp SSH? It's a secure shell library for .NET. So what does it mean? It means that the people who connected to this command and control server, they are using sharp SSH, which is basically a C-sharp library. OK, so that means that probably you know, they had a special need why they use this specific uh, software. And in particular, if you look at the Sharp SSH feature list, uh, we find that it supports uh, password and public key authentication. And most important of all, it supports stream forwarding. And it is exactly the stream forwarding they were using here uh, in order to uh, forward the traffic from this process to the back end. So for this specific feature, they used Sharp SSH. The other reason why I think they use Sharp SSH is simply because uh, it was compatible with uh, their already uh, uh, infrastructure, meaning that probably the infrastructure was in .NET. Uh, what about the guy who created uh, this tool, Tamir Gal? I also, you know, Google him. Um, Tamir Gal is a manager, a software developer. He works at a company in Israel. Uh, he has like a lot of specialty. He used to work for Cisco, has a strong background in networking and so on. My personal opinion is that he has absolutely no connection with Duku. That's my personal opinion. I tried to add him on LinkedIn and ask him, 
but he didn't want to accept my, uh, my invitation for some reason. But I don't think that he has any connection, to be honest. Well, anyways, so um, the main server of Duco, I think it remains unknown. But we found some uh, quite interesting clues here. And let me show you an example. Uh, one of the things we noticed from one of the servers were like hundreds of different logins. So this server had about 427 different logins throughout the time. So we thought, probably this is not manual, this must be automatic, and that is the reason why they use uh, .NET. So the whole system, whole infrastructure is fully automated, right? So they have a daemon which reconnects to the server when the connection is dropped, and they forward the traffic automatically. So uh, we looked at the uh, login times, so here's like just some examples of login times on October 16, 2011. Uh, and we had the idea, let's try to plot the times, you know, to see exactly when this uh, uh, server was active. And we got some interesting results. What you see here is like this server was used in about seven different campaigns. And each campaign, each uh, uh, targeted attack lasted for about one week. So it was used back there somewhere in uh, March 2011, then it was used in May, in June, in July, August, September, and finally, here in October, you know, you see like a huge spike in usage. And I think this is the reason, you know, they were getting more and more confident. So they started to use uh, servers more and more actively to, to attack more and more targets, which is the reason why they actually got caught. But we had another idea. Um, uh, we had the idea, let's try to plot these times, you know, on a 24-hour um, graphic to see when these people sleep. Maybe it's not fully automatic, right? So what we got when we put that into a graphic, we got something like this. So I think this is a pretty clear indication this is not an automatic system. An automatic system, you know, will have like a flat line. So what we see here is that we have a bunch of people who go to work around 7 a.m. Um, and here we're talking about GMT. So it depends. So they get to work around 7 a.m. Then they have some kind of a uh, smoke break around 11. <laughs> uh, they have lunch at 2 p.m. I guess this is lunch. And then they go home. They go home around 6. And you see that when they get home, they also start working again. So this kind of really hardworking people here. <laughs> um, and they keep working, you know, on a almost 24-7 24, uh, 24 schedule. So I think that's like not just one person, but multiple people. And here it's like a very good question, you know. Um, when do you guys go to work? Do you go to work like 8, 9? Who goes, let's say, who goes to work at 8? A few people. Who goes to work at 9? More people. Who goes to work at 10? Yeah. So most people go to work at 9. So uh, if, we, if we add, imagine that we go back here, 7, right? We put uh, 7 plus, uh, okay, 7, 9, that's a difference of 2. So that means that probably the attackers were somewhere GMT plus two, maybe GMT plus three, it depends. Uh, it depends when they really go to, you know, to work. Maybe they go at nine, maybe they go at 10. So I think that's the probable location of these people. Um, another observation is that uh, there were like uh, two, three victims per command and control servers, no more. So they had like a pretty specialized uh, infrastructure and they didn't use one CNC for a lot of victims. Uh, and there were a lot of errors, a lot of errors, disconnects, crashes, you know. It was, I think for them it was awful, it was almost a nightmare. Uh, if you remember what I said when I googled the sharp SSH, the first hit was tired of SSH, uh, of sharp SSH errors. I tell you that probably these people are tired of sharp SSH, but I'm, I don't think they have like uh, any good alternative. So uh, there are many errors, uh, there were like many waves of operations, and from these waves of operations we extracted some interesting information. Uh, let me give you an example. So when they hacked the server, the first thing they would do, they would upload the script to identify what the server is about. So this script, which is a bash script, you can see it here, maybe you can see it, uh, will do stuff like, you know, they'll list the uptime, they will uh, list the root and home folders, uh, check if it's virtualized, kernel version, CPU, memory info, then like a net stat, they'll turn it to Google, uh, they'll do the, like a tracer to HTTP slash, uh, slash google.com. So, which is actually quite a funny thing. If you try that, you know, just try that on Linux. 
And what you get when you do trace.http or says name or service not known, because it's not the right format. When you want to do like a trace route, you don't put the protocol in front of that. So which is kind of a funny error in my opinion. So that never worked actually. <laughs> I don't think it would work. Um, and actually there were like more similar errors, more, more mistakes that we could find. And these are also examples that you can see from some of the servers. You see that they do a lot of IP tables, they just want to see uh, and then they do like open SSH minus V, which doesn't work because that's not the name of the daemon. Then they do SSHD minus V, then SSH minus help doesn't work, it's not the right option. So they do my open uh, SSHD minus minus help, then they do SSHD minus H. Then uh, they do an update, uh, then they try very interesting command, yum install open SSH 5. That's because uh, CentOS has open SSH 4.3. So they want to install version 5 for some reason. But this command doesn't work because in uh, CentOS there is no such thing as OpenSSH 5. It doesn't work. So they try like uh, yum search OpenSSH, doesn't work. Yum update OpenSSH server, doesn't work. Uh, then they edit the configuration file. They, they try to use Pico. Uh, it doesn't work because it's not installed. They install Pico, they install Hana, and they keep editing and so on and so on. This is another very interesting example. They, they uh, do some netcat, netstat, and then they do yum, yum install rc-conf. That doesn't work. Then they do yum install rc-conf, doesn't work. Then they do yum search rc-conf, doesn't work. Then they do yum search rc-conf, doesn't work. Finally, and this is really awful, they do yum search rc-space-conf. Which, which, which is tricky. Uh, well, first of all, there is no rcconf on CentOS, by the way. That's a Debian-specific feature. Uh, and when you do yum search, don't do that, by the way. Yum search rc space conf, you get about 9,000 lines on your terminal, simply because it matches pretty much every single package which has rc in it. So that's like, you know, it's, uh, it's very messy, don't it? Yeah. This is what I tried. And this is also funny, in my opinion, mon SSHD config. <laughs> no idea what was going on. Uh, here's another, another very good example. This is a lesson in using the FTP command on Linux. So they try, I, I can imagine what is going on here. Probably there's like two guys. There's like a boss and there's like, you know, an apprentice. So the boss says, you know, fetch the kernel from kernel org and see how fast it is. So he says, yes, boss. So he goes and does vget kernel.org, which doesn't really work. So he's like, OK, remove index. And then he tries ftp, ftp, slash, slash, ftp, kernel, or slash, pop. Does not work. Then he tries man ftp. OK, so he says, OK, I need to put the minus v option to see what the error was. So he does ftp minus v, ftp, kernel.org, doesn't work because you know this one is extra. Finally, he, 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 he does the right thing. But for some uh, no reason, it doesn't work. It checks the firewall again. Again, it fails. Again, it fails. Finally, he manages to get the right command. Uh, and now, there is a reason why he's doing that. And here's how they did it in the script. So the script was probably developed later, when the, uh, you know, the guru got uh, you know, fed up with, uh, with the apprentice. So, I'll, okay, I'll, I'll write it in the script. I put that in the script, and the script will simply do a vget to kernel or slash the kernel. And by the way, kernel 2.6.28 uh, was released in 2009, correct? Uh, at the end of 2008. So, probably they did all this stuff at the end of 2008. Right. Uh, and now I'll invite my colleague Vitaly to take over and tell you a bit about the mystery of the Duku framework. Yes, uh, there were several mysteries and uh, some of them were solved, some are still mysteries. So uh, starting from the mysteries that we solved, mystery of Duku framework. So if you take a look at the um, payload DOL of Duku, which has a real logics uh, useful Hackers. Uh, it has several parts and some, you know, ropes with the standard libraries from the compiler, uh, from the Microsoft Visual C++ compiler. You can see uh, here the, like, you know, the native C++ code with STL, some uh, runtime library code, and so on. But the biggest part, 
payload is written with something completely different. There are no traces uh, related to to the you know standard libraries and the developers, um, and this code seemed to be not you know be very uh, common for the C++ developers, and it has at all no links to the to the C++. So it, it seems to be written either in uh, C language or uh, linked uh, and com compiled and linked from some other probably unknown language. So these were two options that we, we wanted to check and we were not sure because we haven't seen anything similar like that before in, in any other uh, malware. So we asked the programming community to help us identify what is that based on the, you know, some listings of this assembly and uh, partly uh, reconstructed uh, pseudocode, which you can see here. Uh, this is how it probably looked like in the in the beginning. Uh, so from here you can see that it was probably event-oriented model and uh, callback-oriented. So this is the style that was used to uh, create uh, the code of the payload. So uh, we appealed to the community and we got many responses. Uh, many opinions on that. Uh, people started suggesting, you know, all these strange uh, names of the programming languages that we, ha we have never uh, seen before. Uh, however, the most useful was a comment from this guy uh, calls it himself Igor S K, probably a Russian guy. Uh, he he said that he is 99% sure that this is code produced by uh, Microsoft Visual C with the specific options for compiling to optimize uh, size of the code and uh, do not use inline, not include inline functions. And uh, this was actually the main uh, version that we checked. Uh, so what we did, we, we took part of the code again and um, we tried to uh, recreate, uh, to reconstruct the, the C code that actually uh, stands for, uh, for this assembly listing. And when we got the, the C code, we managed to compile with these options. We managed to compile and get exactly the same code. Uh, you can see here on the right what we got uh, after disassembling the compiled C code, which we recreated. And this is actually the C code, which stands for it. Um, so <clears throat> this mystery was solved, and it seems to be that the, the attackers used Microsoft Visual C version 2008 with optimized size and uh, do not include inline functions. So with these options, uh, it produced exactly the same thing. Uh, but that also shows that uh, they have some custom framework with specific architecture that the developers probably enforced to use uh, while creating the modules. So perhaps they even have a software architect. Uh, some unsolved mysteries. Uh, there are actually several mysteries. Uh, one of them is just simple questions like how many CNC servers uh, or proxies out there in total? And where is the, the central, the most valuable, most interesting uh, CNC which has business projects? We didn't find that yet. Um, also, to unsolved mysteries extracted from the servers we analyzed related to the SSH and operations. Um, <coughs> We recovered a deleted known host file, which indicated uh, login attempts on um, in, into two servers. That you can see here, uh, the server number one is ftp.unusualstatuecollection.net. What is that? How is that related to to our case? Well, and if you remember the Stuxnet CNC uh, domains. They were like mypremierfootball.com, todaysfootball.com, which kind of you know reminds of this strange name of unusualstatuecollection.net, and this is actually the front page of unusualstatuecollection.net. Um, it's still up there, and no, there is no obvious you know uh, relation of why it is there in the known host file. And Vitaly, it's, yep. it's in Switzerland, right? Yeah, and it's it's the Swiss run server, Swiss server. So, yeah, we couldn't actually uh, get the image and check ourselves how it is related. Uh, the other server was ftp.ubuntu.com, which is pretty strange. We are not sure if that's real or not. Uh, we are not certain about the relation, but it looks pretty scary, I think. If this guy actually logged in from the 
uh, one of the compromised servers into into this server, that actually poses a pretty bigger risk than we initially thought. Um, so it's still a mystery how it is rated. We uh, contacted uh, Canonical and asked them uh, to check that, and they actually confirmed that they had the SSH public SSH key that we had found in the known host file, and that server was up. Uh, however, it was erased, and we couldn't get an image. So, but still, it was up there, and the bad guys, and the attackers, they they probably connected and logged in into that server. So. This is actually the end of our presentation, and uh, we hope that this light bulb brings you some uh, enlightenment on the topic of uh, Duco and Stuxnet. Thank you very much. If you have some questions. <laughs> if you have some questions, we have maybe one minute to answer, so please shoot. We will also be available after the presentation at the coffee break. Yeah, who, who, are the, uh, who do you think, based on all those errors that they made, who do you think the, uh, the people are running this, this botnet? Who do, you, do we think these people are? Yeah. Uh, could you be more specific? <laughs> <laughs> you mean the... <laughs> No, no, so, so actually probably you missed the beginning of the presentation or maybe we didn't explain it clearly, but this is a nation state sponsored attack, you know, against mostly Iranian targets. So, uh, you know, that probably gives you an idea who the people behind the attack were, whoever has interest to spy on Iran at the moment. So there are like not so many options. And actually, uh, what I think here, and this, this is quite normal. All these mistakes that you're seeing, these are pretty much normal. And the reason is that how it happens, you know, in the normal life, you have your best people. Your best people, like from attacker side, are tasked with getting uh, access to the uh, machine. So they are the ones who hack the machines. Then you have like the lower people who do the hard job, like exfiltrating the data. So those are people who don't know how to use FTP, don't know how to use VGET, you know, they pull up uh, man pages for man, and uh, so on. <laughs> so this is quite normal, I would say, but, uh, you know, it indicates that they, they're also normal people. That was my question, thank you. Welcome. I think we have a time, time's up, I think. So, up. Uh, yeah, if uh, you want to continue conversation, please, uh, we can do that outside.